right, welcome to another edition of the Plus One Interview. And today we got Matt Feld back with us to give us some more updates on the MIAA and the board meetings that's occurred. Matt, how are you doing since the last time we talked? Good. What's going on? How are you? Definitely better with some uh, with some nicer weather. How are you doing? Yeah, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to try and go and enjoy the weather. So, yeah, without time. Everyone gets to go outside and hopefully get to go to the beach at some point. Yeah, next thing you know, it's going to be 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a lot's happened since we since the last time we talked. The last, the last time we talked, we were, optimi- we were optimistic about the baseball season. And then that got canceled, and then they've been having board meetings. Just tell me about the, the meetings that you've attended and what's been discussed. Yep, so the MIA Board of Directors met uh, a little over, uh, just over two weeks ago um, and kind of talked about next steps um, as it looks, you know, how to go about handling fall sports um, as schools try to reopen up come September. The, the MIA has created a coronavirus task force. Um, which consists of athletic directors, principals, and superintendents, which will go about ways um, that schools can handle restrictions that come down from the Department of Public Health and from the governor's office uh, when it comes to certainly new ways that uh, programs are going to have to handle fans and, you know, kids sharing water bottles and high fives and, and, you know, on the sidelines, whether it be soccer, football, you know, cross country, you know, all the way down the line. So, that task force will be in charge of, of seeing ways that schools can, can navigate those new restrictions that are certainly going to come into place. Um, and they're also going to look at ways that potentially spring teams can maybe get together for a day or two over the summer when the governor, you know, eases further restrictions down the road. Um, so that teams that weren't able to, you know, have a practice or, or spend any time together this spring uh, may be able to do that at the end of July or early August. And they also discussed about potentially uh, this concerning uh, concern basketball that coaches can have off-season contact with players. Is, am I correct? Yeah, there's there, the individual sport committees, um, particularly for the spring, um, are going to get together and talk about potential proposals that they could bring to the board of directors um, that could then be voted on as it pertains to out-of-season contact. Certainly a number of coaches are pushing for that since they haven't been able to work with their kids at all over the last couple of months. Um, they've able to, been able to communicate via Zoom or phone call, um, but a lot of them are looking for, you know, hands-on contact due to the fact that there's no AAU for the most part. There's no Legion baseball for the most part. Um, a lot of spring and summer leagues have already been canceled. So coaches uh, at the high school level are, are hoping to be able to work with their kids more so that when the seasons roll around uh, next year, these kids have not been playing without a coach, you know, for so long. Yeah, now, now as we, as we concerned with the – you know, how spring sports has been canceled. There, there were some leagues that were trying to have some type of uh, acknowledgement for teams or some type of competition. Can yeah. you talk a little about that? Yeah, for sure. So in particular, um, lacrosse is trying to put together, I think, some sort of senior game. Uh, I believe that's supposed to be in the third week in July, uh, you know, where they can find a way to get 20, you know, a, a number of teams um, you know, seniors get on the field for pretty much some sort of last all-star game together at a high school someplace. Uh, you know, I think some individual Legion baseball leagues, even though American Legion baseball overall um, has canceled its state tournament, I think they're hoping to find a way to play some independent games just so kids can get on a field someplace. Um, some youth baseball and youth basketball leagues have already reached out to specific schools that could be open uh, in the middle of June to use their facilities. Again, as the governor moves along his phases to phase two to phase three, where youth sports get to be allowed. So people are already looking at potential avenues where kids can just get on a field, get on a basketball court, um, and find ways to kind of interact with one another uh, mm-hmm. after being away from their friends and from the sport for so long. Yeah, and this also impacts the, all the all-star games that usually occur with the, in like June or July. I know over here there's the Gannis game that, that happens. I don't know yep. if that's even going to happen at this point in some all-star, baseball all-star games. Uh, what, are, what is the impact on this with those? Yeah, it's unfortunate, right? I mean, I think for most of those are usually reserved for seniors. There's every once in a while a junior might be selected if they're really um, above and beyond. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, the Gannis game, the Shriners game, um, you know, there's Bay State games for baseball, these games that are showcases um, for underclassmen and, and then kind of a coronation of high school careers for seniors. Um, not having them is, a, is really unfortunate. I mean, these kids 
um, kind of work their entire careers to have the opportunities um, to play in these games. And Massachusetts doesn't have a lot of all-star games. So when you're the best player at one school and you can go out and, and maybe play with the best player from another school, maybe you guys played together at AAU at one point, you know, it's a really cool opportunity for these kids that have never played together to kind of have their own kind of super team for a day. And, and to not have those is, is a loss of, of experience. It's a loss of kind of a really memorable day. Um, where kids really for the final time get to put on a high school uniform to some extent before they begin college. And so that's the biggest loss right there is there's really no bow um, on these high school career for these kids. Yeah, and, and now we're, you know, they've, they've done that part with the spring. Now we're, we're starting to look at the fall sports and the impact that this pandemic is going to have on, on fall sports. Are, have you gotten any update on anything of what's going to happen with the fall sports? Well, I think people are becoming increasingly optimistic about the possibility of a fall season. I think if you ask people two or three weeks ago, they were incredibly nervous. But the governor starting his phasing, you know, his phase plan to reopen the state um, gradually beginning this past Monday and then continuing this upcoming Monday on Memorial Day. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, with each phase being about three weeks, by the end of July, you know, you kind of enter if everything goes according to plan, this kind of new normal phase. Um, so I think people are looking at two different things. Um, one is which the season goes on as scheduled, uh, but there are, of course, severe restrictions in place. Um, again, you know, kids are not going to be able to drink out of the same water bottle on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's obviously a real chance that spectators will not be allowed at games in the fall. Um, is there a limit in terms of how many kids can get on a bus when they're going on the road to a road game, things like that. And then I think you're also looking at the possibility of a shortened season where, you know, football and, and a number of fall sports sometimes start before kids go back to school. Uh, and it's really hard for me to believe that educators, the first time that, you know, they're going to be seeing students is on a football field or on a soccer field. Um, the yeah. odds are that schools are going to want the time to kind of get adjusted to whatever new restrictions are going on in the classroom, whether they be in the cafeteria or in a gym class. In a, a, you know, in, a, in the hallways. Um, and then maybe, you know, in the middle of September, maybe then kids can get out on the field um, and play. Maybe if you're football, maybe you're playing a five game regular season instead of seven. If, if you're soccer, maybe you're playing 15 games instead of 20. But I think, you know, as things hopefully continue to improve and people follow the guidelines and stay safe and, and find ways to make sure they're not interacting with a huge amount of people. Um, hopefully we can get back on the course where kids get back in the classroom in the fall. And as a result, uh, athletics go with it. And would that impact the playoffs? Because the playoffs happen probably around like November or so before the big Thanksgiving game. So yep. would, would that be something they look at is revamping the, the postseason? Yeah, I, I think everything would be on the table at that point for sure if there's a shortened season. I think they'd have to find ways. You know, I don't think you could have as many teams in the playoffs if you're only playing five games. You know, some people, some colleges – um, are actually starting college earlier this year. You know, schools like Notre Dame, I saw, are actually going back. South Carolina is going back earlier in August because mm -hmm. with, the, with the flu season usually rolling around Thanksgiving, they anticipate that they might not be able to have kids between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So it would be interesting to me if that's something the MIA explores where they push the Super Bowls up, maybe push the playoffs up, um, have less teams in the playoff as a result. You know, again, short and regular season, short and playoffs to kind of get the season in. Um, to kind of avoid coinciding with the flu season after Thanksgiving. So I definitely think it's something on the table where, you know, around that Thanksgiving time, you know, the playoffs could look a whole lot different than they usually do uh, in a normal year. Yeah. Now, and also there were certain, there were teams that were supposed to switch conferences, this upcoming season, move conferences. Uh, this, does this impact that in any type of way, or is this still those teams that were going to move conferences still, their, their, their plans to move conferences are still a go? Yeah, those, those, any, any team that was scheduled to move a league, um, you know, should still be, you know, my, my guess is in all cases we'll, we'll continue to do that. That shouldn't impact this in any way. Um, you know, anything that's already been voted on or decided on would have to have a new vote um, to kind of scrap what was already in place. Um, so whether you're moving leagues from a large to a small, whether you're moving conferences entirely, you know, from the GBL to the Northeast Conference or, or what have you, um, in all instances, those league changes should not have any, you know, that those should not be impacted um, by the disruption of the spring season. Yeah. Now, are they uh, now? I'm, I'm sure there's going to be future meetings. Are is there anything that you know that that has been put aside for for the future meetings or for the upcoming meetings, the next the next go around? 
Yeah. So the tournament management committee will be meeting on June 4th. Uh, that meeting, you know, tournament management committee meetings are usually about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, that meeting can go on for about six to seven hours. Uh, individual sport committees are presenting um, their new divisional alignments for the statewide tournament that we discussed last time, beginning in the fall of 2021. Um, so the tournament management committee will be looking over each divisional alignment. Um, you know, some highlights, basketball will be going to five divisions, football, uh, baseball will be going to five divisions. Um, football's trying to stay eight divisions. The TMC is going to have to go through each one of those sports um, to make sure that they agree with what each individual sport committee um, has voted on for the amount of divisions that they want for the new playoff system beginning in the fall of 2021. Um, and then they're also going to take an hour to, to talk about max preps, the max prep seating formula, which is coming into place in the fall of this upcoming year. Uh, where teams in all sports will no longer be seated by winning percentage, but rather their max preps rating. So the June 4th TMC meeting will certainly be um, huge, notable. Uh, I think a lot of athletic directors and principals have it circled um, due to the fact that it could have large implications for MIA, MIA sports um, down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to quick, quickly touch back on what you, uh, what you talked about a little bit earlier was uh, the, the task force that the, that the board corrected. Um, what were, who... Who took the charge in leading that uh, to yeah. put that together? Yeah, so Jeff Grantino, who's the president of the MIA Board of Directors, um, announced that it would be created. And now Tom Holgate, who's the athletic director at Duxbury, is actually leading up the task force. Uh, and those task forces in general have their own subcommittees, um, you know, how to handle officials, how to handle fans, how to handle athletic interaction, how are we actually going to get sports back on the field. Um, you know, they're working with the governor's office of when it's going to be okay uh, not just for youth sports, but for high school athletes to retake the field. And I think they're also taking their cues from another, a number of states uh, across the country that maybe did not have quite as bad of an outbreak that we had in Massachusetts, Indiana, Iowa, sports, you know, you know uh, states that are already allowing high school athletics beginning in July. They're kind of watching what they're doing. Um, they're on constantly on national calls with athletic directors from across the country um, to see how they're returning to high school sports. Uh, as their restrictions, you know, are eased at a greater pace than Massachusetts and their outbreak isn't quite as bad. So I think those athletic directors in particular, um, again, from across the street, you know, head up but by, uh, by Tom Holgate are kind of taking the lead, having those constant conversations. I know they had multiple meetings yesterday on Thursday. Um, and again, they're taking it day by day, having those conversations with, with Jeff Granatino, the president of the board. And, and, you know, again, taking their cues from the governor's office on when it's okay for high school athletes to return to the field. All right. Uh, that's a lot. There's a lot happening. Within, There's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, there's so much happening. It's, it seems like the time goes by fast. And uh, let's quickly talk about you. You recently wrote two two columns uh, on all decade teams for basketball and baseball. Just just talk to me about that and what, what gave you the idea to put that together and uh, how was the process of putting that, those lists together? Yeah, sure. So, of course, we're currently kind of in this void of no live sports, you know, across the board, which is really difficult. Um, you know, our, us as sports writers, whether you're high school, college or professional sports writers, I mean, not having any content to cover on a daily basis, particularly in the spring when the weather gets nice, it's incredibly challenging. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just decided, I believe it was in the end of March or beginning of April, that I thought it'd be a really good idea to kind of look at some of the top players that have come through Massachusetts on the basketball court, on the baseball field. I'm working on one for football right now. Um, and we'll turn it over to lacrosse and tennis uh, and all the other sports going forward. I just thought it would be a really good idea to kind of highlight um, the top experience, you know, the, the top players that fans and spectators and media members have had the chance to, to watch and look at um, and enjoy seeing play over the last 10 years. And people kind of forget the top players that have come through the state um, through here. We've had a number of Division One players. We've had a number of Division One professional athletes that have come through here. Um, and it's really exciting to kind of look back on those careers and, and kind of see, you know, what type of impact they made on Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, you did one for boys and girls in basketball? Yes, boys and girls. Um, and again, that was just to make sure, again, people kind of forget both on the boys and the girls side, the talent that's come through. So to have those opportunities um, is really, you know, is, is really unique. You know, you look back on a player that played in 2011 or 2012, you know, that's eight, nine years ago, and you forget – how good they were, whether it was Pat yeah. Connaughton who played at Notre Dame and now is playing in the NBA, you know, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Lauren Maness who played at Bishop Fian and is now playing in, in the WNBA. So, you know, you just have this, you know, you look back and, and you look at players that are playing in major, major league baseball and you're playing like I said, playing at professional level in basketball. And now, you know, for football, someone like Lucas Dennis who played at Everett is now an undrafted free agent signee with the Tampa Bay Bucks. So it's really unique. People forget, I guess, 
you know, because Massachusetts is such a small state, just the overall talent that we have here. Yeah, and and also coming out of high school, there's we've got some kids out of the state that's going to major, to major college programs. I know one. I know we were a kid from uh, the kid from Mansfield. He's going to Michigan. Yes. Uh, another kid from Springfield Central. He's going out to Michigan State. So there's there's talent here. And was it there? In the WNBA this year, wasn't a player from Holy Cross just recently drafted in the, in the WNBA? Yeah, Lauren Manis, yeah, the star from Bishop Fian. But you're right, yeah, especially, you know, in football. I mean, we got players going to Michigan. We have players going to, you know, players being offered by Tennessee. Obviously, players going to Boston College. Players, you know, going to Colorado State. Players going to, you know, Notre Dame. Um, again, when you're in such a small state, I think people kind of look at, you know, the – it's really hard to, to kind of see the fact that there's a lot of individual talent at these schools. Yeah. It's really, really impressive um, to kind of see the talent that comes through here. And again, you might go see a team that's two and ten, um, and maybe their record as a result doesn't really make you think like they've got a great player on their team. But they might have one really, really good wide receiver, or they might have a terrific point guard that's just unfortunately surrounded by players that are not quite at that level. So, you know, I'm a pretty big believer. If you're good enough, the colleges are going to find you. Yeah. Uh, and I think these players are proving that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then also, there was another one the Tight end from Boston College, I think he he got picked up by he didn't go draft he didn't get drafted, but he got picked up by NFL team too, and he's from he's not he's from Linfield, so yeah, yeah definitely a lot of a lot of kids. Massachusetts has been representing with a lot of talent, putting putting them out there. All right, Matt, makes if they want to go read the, if they want to go read those articles, please let them know where they, where they can find it. Yep, you can find them at either the Boston at bostonherald.com or you can look on my Twitter feed, Matty Feld, 612, M A T T Y F E L D, 612. Uh, always looking for story ideas. My DMs are open, so feel free to drop them in, you know, drop whatever ideas you have in there. Um, and it's always great to hear from everybody. All right, man. Matt, thank you once again. And I'm sure we'll be chatting again in the next couple months uh, once uh, the, meet, the next meeting goes by and we'll get closer to fall sports. So thank you, man, for always coming and joining us and telling, give it, updating the people on what's going on at this, with the MIA. Absolutely, man. Be good, stay safe, and enjoy the good weather. All right, you too, man. Have a good one. All right, you guys been watching the Plus One interview. That was Matt Feld from Boston Herald. Have a great day, ladies and gentlemen.